Darcy started uh, Silver Lining Solutions in 2016, and they were processing, they are processing long-term care Medicaid applications for residents in nursing homes in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, uh, New England. Right. And Maine Care application has a five-year look back for all the income assets open and closed bank accounts. So her team goes in and collects all the information you need and pulls it all together and creates a plan for you. So um, Darcy, uh, I just want to point out a couple of things personally for you. Mm -hmm. Recently was honored by the North Shore uh, Chamber of Commerce in, in Massachusetts as one of the five 2022 Diamond Awards for Local Women in Business, Leadership, and Influence. She was awarded regarding commitment and passion for leading with purpose, empowering women, and serving others, and making an impact in the community professionally and personally. And that, that's a really nice thing. So thank you. Thank you for coming to Berwick. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I think this is going to be really informative. And it's our third in our series of um, Medicare, housing, and Medicaid. It's kind yeah. of giving us the complete picture now. So thank you so much, Sharon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Um, as Sharon indicated, so I've been doing Medicaid applications for the last 15 years now. It's crazy that I can say that. Um, my company is based out of Topsfield, Massachusetts. That's where um, I've lived for the last, well, 20 years. We raised our children there. And a year and a half ago, my husband bought land and we built a house in South Berwick. So I am now a Mainer. <laughs> um, so my company is still based in Massachusetts, but I, am, I live here. Um, when I opened my own company in 2000, and actually I left the company that I was working for in 2015, started my own company as a DBA, and then in 2016 I incorporated Silver Lining Solutions. Um, at that time I was working with an elder law attorney in Kenny Bunkport doing his main care application. So I, Massachusetts and Maine are very, very similar in how they process and how assets are handled, especially with spouses. So it was an easy transition to for me to take on main care applications. Um, and now that I am physically here, live here, um, you know, I do promote main care more on my own through different events, different groups. Um, I work with coastal transitions and also, oh, now it's gonna forget, I'm gonna forget the name of the place, in Kenny Bunkport, right downtown. Um, a, Avatar no, it's like a place, not a place for mom. I can't think of it. I'm so sorry. Um, it will come to me. <laughs> um, but I've, so I work with different groups like that, that they refer main applications, main care applications and clients that need main care. Because in Maine, in Massachusetts, I have four or five competitors. In Maine, there isn't anyone like me. You don't have a middleman consultant. Um, either the nursing homes will work directly with the families to do the main care application or they refer you to an elder law attorney. The elder law attorneys can charge anywhere from $7,000 to $15,000 to do an application process. So we're kind of in between. We charge $3,000 flat fee to do the full application process. Um, you all have, I believe you all have the handout. And I, ha I talk a lot, so I have to kind of follow. Um, so there is a five-year look back. We're going to go through the process. There is a five-year look back of all income and assets, as Sharon mentioned. And what they do with the application, and I have a copy of an application here, um, you have to fill out, and if there's a spouse, you have to fill out all of the information for your spouse as well. And I'm going to direct it more towards nursing home care and a main care long-term care application than just the, ma the main care community application for community benefits. Um, obviously it's no one he here, but sometimes we are working with people in their 70s that have parents in their 90s that, that need to transition to a nursing home. It's also good knowledge for everyone to realize that there is a five-year look back and if you sell your house, you can't give money away to your children um, and qualify for main care. What happens is if you um, because they will look at, within that five-year look back, they look at, okay, they sold their house on 120 Main Street, 
in 2019, if they sold the house for $300,000, where did that $300,000 go to? They look at all of the bank statements. What our company does is we take those bank, we take the five years of bank statements, we show all transactions, we do full spreadsheets. So if you're trans, um, transferring money from a savings account to a checking account or from an IRA money market account to a checking account, we follow that money. So we, um, spell that all out for main care for the main care workers so that they can see that right up front You have a question. Yeah, just a quick question. There are some nursing homes assisted living who you buy in you put down 200,000 200,000 whatever then you get mm -hmm. when you pass 80% back or your uh, heirs do Does that count as where you put your money? I mean do they consider that in the look back? They do consider it in the look back, but if you're p putting a lump sum towards an assisted living or p buying into a nursing home, that will all be verified through the copies of your checks. So they will see that if it's Durgan Pines and you're buying into there or Avita of Wells, they we follow the money. So we'll show every month check, you know, seven eight thousand dollars a month being paid to the nursing home. And so that's all verified that way. What they're really looking for is, and it happens not often, but it does happen, that someone will sell a house and then say, you know, they've got three children, they love their children, they want to give each of their children or their grandchildren $25,000 each. Well, now you're looking at a $75,000 penalty period that main care won't cover $75,000 worth of days or months time frame to the nursing home. And then you, we have to go back to the family and say either you need to repay the money or, you know, we have to find a way to pay that back because the nursing home is not going to be covered for that t period of time. Um, so that's where the five-year look back really comes in is if you've had what was your balance five years ago and where was that money spent from that period of time. Is New Hampshire set up at pretty much the same way? I live in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is set up the same exact way except for spouses. Um, if there is a spouse that's still living at home and one spouse that goes into the nursing home, the spouse at home, it's ca they call it a 50-50 divide. So they look at what the total assets were at the time of admission and then 50% goes to the wife and 50% goes to the husband and then it gets spent down from there. So the f I always put the husband in the nursing home for my <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, if the husband goes in the nursing home, he has to spend his 50% down to a $2,000 limit. The handout that I gave you, those numbers have recently changed for the spouse at, the, at home. That it, Their federal regulation is now $148,600 that they're allowed to keep. So anything above and beyond that um, would be considered a spend down for a spouse in the house. Um, and we work with the families on the appropriate spend down items. And I think on the left hand side of the column, I mentioned spend down about setting up prepaid funerals. We always, that's the first recommendation that we always make um, to make sure that your funeral is set up because it is an allowable spend down expense. Main care, Mass Health, Medicaid, they don't have um, a requirement. There isn't a maximum amount, it's all up to individual beliefs. Um, you know, I have some Jewish families that have set up twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars full funerals. Um, cremation, since the pandemic, cremations are very popular. We could used to be able to get a basic cremation for about fifteen hundred to three thousand. Cremations are now around five thousand to eight thousand um, dollars. But it is an allowable spend down expense, and it's the first thing that we always recommend. Um, if you have extra assets, you can also open a burial only expense account for $1,500. That is any incidentals above and beyond the cost of a funeral. Um, catering services after the funeral, gra opening a gravesite, engraving of a stone. Um, and it, you can also use that money for travel expenses for anyone that needed to come in out of town. So it's just another way to protect a little bit of money for any incidentals above and beyond the cost of the funeral. Any questions on that part? Just to be clear, is main care, Medicaid? Yes. The same. Yep, so Medicaid is the federal government program. Um, everyone 65 and over, most people 65 and over fall into the Medicare plan, which I think Chris had spoken yeah. about. Um, so Medicare, 
basically everyone gets. Medicaid is for low income, low assets. It's the federal government program, but it's administered by the states. So the states take the federal guidelines of the, the asset amount um, and the time frames and just the documents, the five year look back, that's all federal, federally mandated. And then they have their own individual requirements. In Massachusetts, a person has to be under $2,000. In Maine, a couple years ago, they switched it to a person, an applicant would have to be under $10,000. So that's a difference between the two states. Do you have to be enrolled in Medicare Part B to qualify for this? Because, no. Okay, because I was under the Maine State Retirement. And yeah, no, you don't. It's a completely different program. Um, and again, the Massachusetts application is 34 pages long. Maine is about 18 to 20 pages long. Um, so, you know, some people want to be able to fill it out on their own, and they're absolutely entitled to be able to do that, but some families just want that extra help to ensure that the application is submitted correctly um, and in a timely manner. Just a quick question. Long-term, I mean, there's private long-term care like Genworth, et cetera. Yep, long -term, that's long-term care insurance. Um, okay, so so long-term care insurance is a whole, that's a private, you would right. buy into that with like a premium. And then depending on what the benefits are, some um, long-term care insurance policies will pay a nursing home $100 a day. Some really good ones pay $300 a day, which then translates into, what is that, 9000 a month? $300 a day, nine, yeah. So that would cover your full nursing home stay. Well, it doesn't cover everything in Massachusetts, but it would cover um, most of it in here in Maine. Um, a lot of financial advisors are not recommending long-term care insurance policies because they are really expensive. My belief is nursing homes are getting more and more expensive anyway. So if you have any type of assets, buying into a long-term care insurance policy would help just not spend those assets down and deplete them quite quickly. So, it, but it can work in conjunction with a Medicaid application as well. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And where's my note? Um, property. So, if an individual owns a house um, and there's no one else living in the house, the states will require you to put that house up on the market to be sold. Um, they have the legal right to put a lien on the house um, in the meantime so that when it does sell, they can recoup their losses. So if, they, if Medicaid pays out or main care pays out $30,000 for you before the house sells, at the time of the sale, they would recoup their $30,000 and then you would retain the remainder of the proceeds. Um, it goes into your bank account and now you're back on private pay spend down um, until those assets are depleted. When there was a spouse in the house, they, the, again, the wife is in the house and we transferred the deed from joint ownership over to the spouse in the house as a sole um, individual ownership. Um, the state does not put a lien on the house at that point, so you don't lose your house. It's one of the, our most frequently asked questions is, my husband's going into the nursing home, am I going to lose your house, my house? The answer is no. Um, we're able to transfer that over and mean in Massachusetts, we're able to transfer that over to this, it, the spouse still at home as an individual. But that doesn't alleviate the mortgage or taxes. Right? No, it doesn't. So it doesn't. House, you could lose your house, but the state does give you an allowance. So if, a, did you have a question? No, no, oh, no, I was, so. I, I, was like, I was like, oh. Doing down my medical. So what they do is, it, then this goes from the assets to the income side of things. If the individual in the nursing home, say let he receives $2,500 a month in Social Security and pension, but the wife only receives $1,500 a month in pension, but if the mortgage, the homeowner's insurance, the taxes, um, utilities, they look at what your shelter, her shelter expenses would be, she would be able to maintain part of the husband's income, if not all of it, to still pay for the house and pay for the shelter. The issue is, is that it doesn't cover groceries, it doesn't cover, cover pharmacy, it doesn't cover a lot of like, you know, if she wants to go get her hair cut every, every other week. It doesn't cover that. Um, but it does cover the shelter expenses, the household expenses. So it gives them a little bit of a slush to be able to do that. Again, if the wife, 
if the spouse still living at home is over that $148,000 asset limit, so say they have $300,000 in assets, all of the assets get moved to the wife's name, but she can only have up to $148,000, we're able to create a spousal annuity. It's a, it's a single premium immediate annuity. So within 30 days, the, she would purchase the over asset, so let's call it $150,000, based upon her life expectancy, she would then get a monthly income stream for, of her own income that would not be paid over to the nursing home. So she could use that money to pay for mortgages and all the other monthly household expenses. So as you can see, it gets kind of complicated. And there are no two cases that are the same. It's a lot of information. In, um, but that's why they hire us, because we know all of the ins and outs on how to fill out the application, what documents are needed, and how to go about the regulations so that we can make sure that the spouse at home is still protected, but yet we can still get the spouse in the nursing home on the Medicaid program. Is there any instance where someone is not eligible for main care? The only ineligibility would be over assets or if we don't have all of the documentation that main care requires. Um, the income thing does come into play only in the fact that if someone has a long-term care insurance policy, they are getting a social security and a pension and, or an annuity or something, and now there's a Medicaid rate. I don't always tell everybody this. There's a Medicaid rate that the nursing homes receive when someone's on Medicaid, and it's about 44000 to $5,000. A private pay rate is anywhere from seventeen to thirteen thousand dollars. So if you have income that's at let's say eight thousand dollars a month because you have a long term care insurance policy or an annuity in all of your income and you're receiving eight thousand dollars a month. So you're above we call it the over under. You're over the Medicaid rate of $4,000, but you're under the private pay rate of $10,000. So you, we still have to go through the process. The state still makes that determination that the person falls into an over-under category, and the nursing home has to accept that income as payment, as opposed to receiving the bigger amount. So, so just so I understand it, so you're telling me, so you're saying that the over-under, so if you're over, Four thousand in income from whatever your sources right. are, okay, but under it all depends on what so there's a there's a scale. Okay. So the nursing homes will determine what your it's in Massachusetts we call it an MMQ rate. What is your hands-on daily bed rate that it costs them? You know, somebody that needs a two-person assist is more expensive than a person that's going, taking their walk or going down to the dining room. So there's different levels and different pay rates of what the state will pay based upon their hands-on skill. So I'm just giving a general that's idea. A general. Yes, there's a general idea. There's a Medicaid rate and then there's a private pay rate. If you fall in between those two rates, that's where you're the over under and that's based upon your income. It does not happen a lot in 15 years. I've had probably five or six cases that that is an issue. I have two right now, but it doesn't happen often. How do they designate? Suppose, I mean, nursing homes, elder care facilities are going to differentiate in terms of cost. I mean, yes. And so... Who they accept, you mean? Well, no, in terms of cost. So if you wanted to, say, go to Kittery Estates in Kittery, mm -hmm. I would assume that's going to be more expensive than, say, something in Presque Isle or Kittery. What I found in Maine is that there are a lot of nursing homes that don't take Medicaid. Um, I have a list that some of them are strictly private pay, some of them you have to have private pay, like you said, for two years up front. You have to, you know, provide two hundred thousand dollars up front, and then when that two hundred thousand is gone from their escrow, then they will still keep you. I don't know if they, because what they that what they tell me is we don't accept Medicaid, so I'm not sure if once the two hundred thousand dollars is depleted, do they just keep you free of care, or do they apply for Medicaid for you at that point? I don't know because I don't have any clients in those buildings. But I know that there are some, and this is where Massachusetts is different. So Massachusetts, if they have 100 beds in a nursing home, they could have all 100 beds being Medicaid. In Maine, they have to register how many beds per building they have. So some, build, some nursing homes don't have any Medicaid beds. Some may have three to five. Some may have up to 20. I guess it all depends on the size, and you have to register for that. 
um, they, the nursing homes have to register. So that's where it differs a little bit. So it's not like every person in a nursing home could apply for Medicaid. You know, some nursing homes do actually rent, you know, on a monthly basis, just mm -hmm. like you would in a apartment, which just seems kind of strange. Assisted living facilities, they're known as just because mm -hmm. my parents in one. And yet there are other home, I mean, nursing care facilities that you pay that big upfront monies Mm -hmm. But you do get some of your heirs get some of your back. Right. So if you pass away before the funds are depleted, you, they would get them back. I'm not sure about that, and I don't want to muddy the waters here, but I, okay. I think in some cases it, it's actually the Bronx That was a unique, yeah, that was a unique independently point. owned facility. So Brooksby Village in Peabody, Mass. has a si similar situation, um, but they are requiring $600,000 in escrow in order to buy in. And then if the person passes away before then, then that 600000 would be handed down to the, to the heirs or the so beneficiaries. The is really to scope out, in a <laughs> sense, what facility you might springboard into to see what the parameters are, as you're suggesting. Maybe they don't take Medicaid. Right, so Maine is de definitely different where, you know, we have the list of the Medicaid, the nursing homes that do accept Medicaid, and then the nursing homes that are strictly private pay. Is so, that a public list? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a public list. I have the list, and when I make the phone calls to say I've got a client, they're looking, we're looking for a bed, and then they tell me, sorry, we're, you know, and it's by region. I, as far north as I go is Portland for the most part, um, although I take that back. I have been north of Portland, but um, from Portland south uh, on my list, there are some that just are strictly private pay. Is there a New Hampshire have Medicaid? Then? New Hampshire does have Medicaid. Um, we, could, we could go to New Hampshire. We just have to be there 30 days to be able to apply for their Medicaid. Program. Right, yeah. right. So, and they do have Medicaid. Um, it's the same process. N New Hampshire requires more documents. They want five years of everything. They want every single check. Maine and Massachusetts are more, any transactions over $1,000 we have to verify. Maine wants every $25, $10 check. They want to see where every single dime How went. Do you get the checks? Because you the banks. You don't get the checks anymore. So, I, my secret is I have a Mass Health, I don't know if I can put this on. <laughs> I have a Mass Health financial request form that we use in Massachusetts. Um, I'm able to use that in Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island for our other states to be able to request those bank statements directly. Massachusetts has a general law that banks cannot charge you for those statements. So, and that's listed on the form. So we are able to get those statements from the banks. So you don't need the actual the checks. checks or yeah. the photocopies or anything like that, right? We do need them. We will have to provide them. For New Hampshire, we have to provide them. The For, actual checks? Not the actual checks, but like a, like on the back, usually with statements, they'll put like that whole month of statement, uh, whole month of checks on one page. So it's not like the, in the olden days when they used to give you back your, right. the actual yeah. checks, the cash checks. Um, just as long as they have a photocopy and they can see <laughs> the olden days. I remember having personal, like the, the checks coming back in the bank statements. <laughs> it's like yesterday for me. So <laughs> move on. I'm getting bank statements online. No yes. check images. Right. You With no it. check images. Yeah, but you can it. print them. Like I have TD Bank and I do online banking. Yeah. You can print the checks. You have to go back into like a little tab under statements yeah, and then you can month. click on it. But be, with my form, I'm able to go back to the bank and the bank can print those checks for me. For five years. For five years. How do we, can we get those, that type of form? No. I can't give you my form. I'm sorry. No, I, I don't mean give you one, so I didn't know if it was available to It's me. not available to Maine. Um, and when I've met with Key Bank in Kenny Bunkport and I showed them my form, they're like eyes lit up. They said, we've never seen a form like this. Um, usually if someone is applying, the power of attorney usually has to go into the bank and request the five years, but there's no written form on your end that would be used. It would just be an internal form that's for the bank. So you can request your own statements, absolutely. But they'll charge you. They'll charge you. They will charge and you. they'll charge you per check. What if you live with your Coffee. son or daughter? How do they view that as income or? Income? So, I, there's two ways. Either the son and daughter move in with you. No. You move in with them. 
are you on it, it depends on if you're on the deed or not or if you're renting from them and you provide no, a rental just, income uh, you know very nice and they, <laughs> they just take you in, <laughs> they just take you in. Oh, that's okay right. that's, yeah that's not happening for me either um it, it all depends I what I would highly recommend is that if you move in with your children that there is some sort of agreement because obviously you're not going to live there for free you're probably going to have to pay a utility bill pay part of their taxes contribute to groceries um, and I would just have a care plan or a lease agreement drawn up to indicate what you're responsible for paying for so that if you did need to apply for Medicaid four or five years down the road that it's all documented of why you writing checks every month to your children so yeah. you can pay for you and we have people that will pay their kids you know twelve thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month under a lease agreement to contribute towards housing because whether you're living in your own house or an apartment you are you would be required to pay for your living so expenses that's considered an asset. what the house well, well no the twelve that whatever you're paying your son or no 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 nope, nope, it's clear it, it clear yeah that clears you yeah. So we would just verify where you live, how long you've lived there, because in Maine we do have to verify where you've lived in the last five years. Um, they have That's a whole separate sheet that we have to fill out for them um, and just indicate where you lived and how much you paid per month. It's a lot of information. All right, let me just see what else. Um, a vehicle is an also a non-countable asset right now. I'm sorry, the vehicle? The vehicle, yep. Um, it used to be that a car would have to be sold in order to be approved if an individual had a car. I'm not sure. Somewhere along the line in the last... I know, but some families do keep that car because if they're taking them in and out to the, a doctor's appointment, sometimes they go out to lunch and an elderly person can't really get into like a big SUV. So if you've got a small four, smaller four-door sedan that the person is comfortable getting in and out of, um, the states are allowing you to keep a car right now. We do have to document what the car is used for, um, but right now they're not forcing cars to be sold. Given at any moment they could change that regulation on me, but <laughs> right the now, spouse would need one, right? the spouse could yes, the spouse can keep a car absolutely without any issue. And if the car is in the husband's name and he's going into the nursing home, we just transfer the registration over to the wife. Or vice versa. The wife's going in, it goes into the husband's name. Okay. And property. Personal needs pur purchases, those are also, I'm going to put that there so I don't have to keep going back. Um, personal need purchases, those are also allowable spend down e expenses. Again, you can't give money away, but if you were to have gone on a trip three or four years ago and you know, we can document that. I had one family, one time it was a husband and wife, and there was a $5,000 cash withdrawal from the bank account. And I was sitting with the woman and her niece, and she, they could, she could not remember what May of 2019, what she did with this $5,000. And then the niece said, she goes, Auntie, didn't you go on a cruise? And she's like, oh, yeah, so you went on a cruise. And I'm like, okay, 2019, do you have anything like a ticket or a stub or anything she only thing she had was the picture of her and her husband holding that like the lifesaver the white lifesaver I submitted that as verification that that was the cruise that they went on and we got it approved it was so that five thousand dollars was actually documented because we could say she went on a cruise so personal expenses like that um, they do allow that um, those types of I you know items um, consolidating accounts. We have families that have, you know, you know, Santander Bank was giving away a toaster, and I went, and, you know, somebody went and opened a CD, and then, you know, we've got different clients with different banks all over the place. What we really do is try to tell the families start to consolidate your accounts down. Obviously, if you have a CD and it hasn't matured yet, or if you have an IRA, you're not going to close that out right now. Um, but if you've got miscellaneous savings accounts, you want to start to consolidate those accounts down um, so that you're working out of just a few accounts and not bank accounts all over the place. Um, the spousal annuity we talked about a little bit. If the spouse is at, the spouse in the house is over $148,000 in total assets, we would set up that annuity for them to be able to give them that extra monthly income stream. 
um, every month. Uh, Long-term care insurance, we also mentioned that that helps delay and postpone, like how much is actually coming out of your savings account every month. Um, there are some, ride, some insurance riders out there too that, it, you know, it's not just use it or lose it. You could look into them that if you don't use it and you pass away before it's used, you can leave the um, partial beneficiaries, can, uh, partial of your premium payments can be left to the beneficiaries. So there is that. Some long-term care insurance policies will cover aids coming into the house. They will cover assisted living costs and they will also cover nursing home costs. So it all just depends on what policy and who, what company you're using for that. Um, irrevocable trust, and I know before we started, started talking that somebody had mentioned a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. Any assets put into an irrevocable trust have to be there for five years and you can't touch it. We have a family that was using, had set up an irrevocable trust and put $100,000 into it. Well, they started using the $100,000 towards the assisted living, but now mom needs to go to a nursing home. And they said, well, that, you know, the $35,000 is in an irrevocable trust. And I said, well, you've been using it, so if you can use it for assisted living, Medicaid is going to tell you you can use it for the nursing home. So it will have to be depleted. Can you use the interest on the irrevocable trust? It all depends on how it's written. So yeah, yeah you have to, right. Here, here's my 500000 okay? Mm -hmm. But any interest earned, you know what I mean? If it's written that way and it, there's no, and this would be a more of a legal issue that you would have to talk to the attorneys about, um, but any interest earned, as long as it doesn't go back to the applicant, because as soon as any assets come back to the applicant, whether that applicant is the trustee or a beneficiary, they're going to say it can all go back. So you really have to be careful and work with a good, solid attorney that knows how to write those exactly. So, and it so, so, so you're saying that if, it's, if, it, if you get a set up with the attorney that interest earned could come back to, like, like obviously you can't be the trustee of your own irrevocable trust, okay? Right. But you'd be a beneficiary of it, okay? But if you're the beneficiary of your own trust... Right. Then you have access to those assets. Well, you don't because you don't control them. But you're beneficiary. So if you're a beneficiary of the assets you put into the trust, you would be able to, the beneficiary gets, um, you may not control it, but you're the beneficiary of it. It would, that's definitely a legal question that you would have to ask the attorney on how that gets set up so it's Medicaid approved. Okay. Um, a lot of times, not a lot of times, but occasionally, it will say, you know, the Smith Family Irrevocable Trust at the top, but then usually sometimes on paragraph 14 on page 22, there will be a, a paragraph that allows the grantor of the trust to be able to still maintain power and access of those assets. So you have to be very careful on how those are written um, and make sure that, you know, when you're working with the attorney that the person, put, the grantor of the trust is not, does not have any access back to those assets. So you work with the attorney because what you're talking about, you're setting up these trusts, either revocable, irrevocable. You need legal. Yes, you advice. need legal consult for that. Yes. So, um, and obviously revocable trusts, if it's revocable, even if it was set up 19, 20 years ago, if it's revocable and it can be changed, the state is going to require you to change that back. So if it was a house put into a revocable trust um, 20 years ago, they're going to ask you to take that out of the trust and if depending on it, what type of ownership it was prior, whether it was joint ownership with a husband and wife or if it was individual ownership, it will have to go back to that, um, that original ownership. And then from there it would be d resolved whether it had to be sold or if it could just go in the spouse's name who's going to reside there. Will they let it though if it's... If it's re revocable, yes. Yeah, if it can be changed... Yes, if, if one of you has to go into the nursing home, the one that is still living in the house, the house would go back into his or her name. Right. But what about a revocable? If it's revocable, that means it can be changed. So anything revocable automatically goes back, whether it's a house. So the other way around? Irrevocable. What happens with that? That has to be held five years with no changes to the assets in the trust. 
and we have to do an asset summary. I usually work with the attorneys on that and doing an asset summary of what was put into the trust five years ago, what the value was at that point, and then what, it, you know, what is still in the trust today, and what is the value today. And if it was a bank account, we have to show the bank account balances every year, just showing that to prove to them that nothing has come out of those bank accounts. Okay. Um, t -t 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 income, we talked to, oh, so with the five-year look back and all of the documentation, so when we go to submit these applications, they are like this big between bank statements, income statements. If you are receiving a pension and you um, get a direct deposit into your bank account, so many people will say, oh, well, you know, my, my pension gets deposited into the bank account. You can see it in the bank account. What that deposit really is is your net deposit. What we need from, like, if you have a MetLife or a, um, Commo, well, a, a state of Ma Maine pension, I have some teachers and things that have pensions, we need the gross monthly pension statement because it will show the gross amount. And then if there's any taxes being taken out, if any health insurance is being taken out, we have to see what all of those deductions are on the gross monthly pension statement to match up the net deposit to the bank account. So it's not just showing the deposit into the bank account. There's all these other documents that we have to show them. Um, Wouldn't that be on the, the income tax? Uh, statement? You would get a um, 10, is it a 1099 at the end of the year? Yeah, because the W-2 is what you, when you're working, the 1099 would be your pension statement for tax returns. That doesn't always have the current gross monthly, because if, if that was for 2022, but in 2023 you got an, a COLA cost of living increase, those numbers are not going to match. So we re what we do is we will contact the pension company directly and ask them for a gross monthly pension statement from that. So you're just looking for the aggregate. So if you have vision care, dental care, or whatever that comes out of that defined pension plan, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. They don't care what you do in the subset. Right. The total. The only thing that they do consider is the federal tax deduction or the state tax deduction because at that point it becomes the state paying the state. Mm -hmm. So when someone is going into a nursing home, we always have them request to stop those federal and state tax deductions. But you can keep your health insurance deductions. Um, Usually if there's a small life insurance premium that's being paid out, if it's a group life insurance, then we have to go and track down the life insurance cash value. Um, most of those are group term policies that do not have a cash value because that leads me into the life insurance. Any life insurance policies that have a cash value will either need to change ownership and beneficiary to a funeral home or be cashed out as part of your spend down. Um, so someone who has a twenty-five to or fifty thousand dollar face value, that may have, you know, a thirty thousand dollar cash value. If you're not going to have a thirty thousand um, dollar or a fifty thousand dollar face value funeral, you are going to want to cash that out because you're going to lose that amount if you change that whole life insurance policy over to the funeral home. So we do work with families on cashing those life insurance policies out. And that's, that, that's what holds our cases up the longest, is trying to work with these life insurance policies, life insurance companies, because they are really they don't like to give their money up. <laughs> so it does take us about six weeks to work with a life insurance company um, for a cash surrender. Yeah? Just, um, I don't want to monopolize. It's OK, no. Um, so if, if I say, because I worked for the Commonwealth for many, many mm -hmm. years, um, and I have a death benefit, mm -hmm. the only way I can get it is if I die. <laughs> so it's I can't. For the Commonwealth, for your. When I get it. Well, yeah. <laughs> she gets it. So it, it all depends. We would have to request a current cash value statement. So if it's got no cash value and it's just a death benefit for her. Well, there, well, there is a cash value. So then it would have to be cashed out. If it's got a cash value, then it's part of your ten. I mean, it's part of your ten thousand dollars. So if it's if the cash value is six thousand dollars and you've got four thousand in your name, you can keep that in place. Um, so it does become part of your asset amount. It's harder in Massachusetts because Massachusetts again has that two thousand dollar cap. Maine has the ten thousand dollar cap. So you probably would be able to keep it um, as long as it's under. But we have to add that cash value to whatever your bank account balance is. To bring you to that asset limit, you no, it's fine. I I don't mind the questions. Um, 
And then VA benefits. Oh, go ahead. So I'm, I'm thinking back to that cruise thing, which I don't do, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Maybe what, you should. <laughs> yeah, sure. Take your vacations now. What about, like, I've got grandkids that we usually give a, a graduation uh, money amount, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the college one is maybe around $1,000. So do we have to start documenting all that stuff just in case for the future for the next You time? should definitely document it. Um, they will ask what that's for. New Hampshire's more particular over gifting because it is considered a gift whether it's Christmas birthdays graduation right so what there's a phrase that we use um, you did not give away your assets in order to divest them right. to qualify for Medicaid yeah. and what we would do is show a history that for all your other grandchildren you did give them money for these events yeah. um, and it's not like you know, just because you're applying for Medicaid, it's not like you were giving everyone a thousand, and all of a sudden you decided to give the next one five thousand. We would have to show a history of that that was what you did. Is there a certain form, or you just make note of it? We would do an affidavit. Um, you know, we you could do a self attestation affidavit, or we would do a notary one through like an attorney. Well, wow, this gets complicated. It does get complicated. So when you mentioned the gift thinking, so. If you can show a history of always making charitable contributions, like, yes, does that get counted? Like does that, like charitable contributions to like the church or hey, to like Center for Wildlife, you know, Kachiko, you library. know, what I mean? Where, wherever the, the library. 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 Um, it all depends. Anything? Like so, again, Maine is specifically looking for anything over a thousand. So if you're giving a thousand dollars every month to the library, they may question it. Um, so, but if you did it once a year, once a year charitable contribution, and you have a history, and you have a history of it, well, it can be verified. You can go back ten years of tax returns showing like every year they were writing right. out this check. Right, right, it would be verified. Right, okay. that I wouldn't think that they would put a penalty period, a penalty on that yeah. type of okay. gifting. Okay, okay, and then the, I have another question. Just because, like, like somebody hiring you works. In two cases, number one, the, the person that's going into the nursing home is able to communicate with you and to sign the documents, mm -hmm. or they have some, you know, finance, you know, some like power of attorney set in place that they can then authorize right. you to do this. Like I live by myself; I have no like, you know, nobody around. I have a brother that's down in in Fort Myers, but he wouldn't be able to come up here to help me. Right. So how does that work? So if you're competent, I would come meet with you at the nursing home. But what if I'm not competent? What, what, no, no, like what if I'm not? So I'm if you're not competent, so <laughs> if the nursing home says, Don't tell you know, Betty Smith is in room 201, you need to go meet with her to do an application, and I come up to meet with you, and it's, clear, it's clearly that you're not competent, I have to go back to the business office man and just say in the nursing homes no they have people you know they have in their charts who's competent who's not competent if it's determined that if i ask you do you know what bank you use and you have no idea what bank you have um i we make the recommendation to the nursing home to file for conservatorship so then you would have an outside attorney become your conservator through that probate the nursing homes usually pay for that <laughs> Um, yeah, but but if there is money, if you do have assets to be spent down, the conservator would p be able to pay his or her expenses from your from your account, in addition to paying for the nursing home and paying for our services. No. <laughs> um. <laughs> we got the northern Maine woods. Yeah. <laughs> So the whole application process, like I said, what we do is we sit down with the families, we fill out the application, the 18 to 20 pages in main care. Um, we start to gather the five years of documents that are needed. It does take us about three or four weeks to get the bank statements, to create all of our spreadsheets. We get everything together. We submit everything to main care on your behalf. About two or three weeks later, main care will send us back a checklist of any additional documents that they will want in regards to what we submitted to them. Um, what Maine does, which is different, again, Maine and New Hampshire do this, they take the application, so we send them all of our documents. They take the application and they review it, 
and then they create a checklist of everything they need. And then the documents get followed up with, and then they say, okay, well, they did send the bank statements and the pension statement and the life insurance information, and then they send a second checklist. So we will work with you on that second checklist of any additional documents that they will need. And in Maine, they need about 10 days. So it really is, that's why we send as much up front. They do give you a little bit of a leeway. We usually call the, ca the main care caseworker to say, especially when it's coming to my Massachusetts office, I just got it, can you give me a little bit of an extension? And they usually do comply. Um, so we'll send them something and then they'll keep, they'll keep the case file open until we get the rest of the documents to them. Do you do New Hampshire? Yes. I do New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and we just picked up a new nursing home in Rhode Island. So I am now doing Rhode Island Medicaid. And they don't have any Medicaid, I'm sure. <laughs> new Hampshire? No, Florida. Uh, Rhode Island. There's um, Mount St. Rita Nursing Home in oh. Cumberland, Rhode Island. There, there might be two beds there for you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, oh, my God. It was, a, it was a good question. Oh, God. Oh. Who's paying the nursing home while all this You go into out. Medicaid pending. So the day the application is submitted, you are now Medicaid pending. The nursing homes know that they are not going to get paid until the application gets approved. And what if it doesn't get approved? Do they kick you out on the street? They will threaten to, um, and they will issue a discharge. If we file an appeal, okay. they can't discharge you under an appeal process. Um, but by hiring an outside company, like we are basically ensuring that we will get this application approved. It might take us a little longer depending if there's trust um, and what the, you know, if there's any hang ups with life insurance policies or if we're having issues getting any type of documentation. Um, but the nursing homes know that when you're working with an outside agency, for the most part, you know, I have a 98.9% .9 approval rating over the last 15 years. So in that 2%, that 1.1% is usually when families don't cooperate. Somebody's taken money. They don't want to provide bank statements or copies of checks. Um, our houses have been transferred to a child, child's name within five years, and the child doesn't want to give it back. Um, those types of things are what, you know, I have one gentleman in Massachusetts that he was in a, he was in a nursing home and discharged himself and moved to Colorado, got himself on a plane and went to Colorado and now we can't find him. <laughs> so that's a problem for us right now. The um, woods. Yeah, go to the Colorado. <laughs> so those types of things are what, you know, that 1% that we can't, you know, there's always these crazy stories. Um, so. I'm curious about your background. You are so knowledgeable, and thank God you're here in Maine. For <laughs> us, it's, like it's a huge asset. Thank you. And, and just from reading little things myself, you must have gone to like college for like eight years to know this <laughs> stuff because what do you, can I ask what your background is and how you accumulated this, especially where the laws are constantly changing and how do you stay abreast? Thank you. Um, I'm a lot older than I may appear. Um, I, I graduated from St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire in 1990. I worked in an ad agency for 10 years. I then had my first daughter in 2000 and I had two more daughters after that. So I was a stay-at-home mom for um, for 10 years until my youngest was going into first grade and I needed to be able to um, be able to get them on and off the bus. They all did gymnastics, they played sports, they were in Girl Scouts. I needed to be able to run them around while my husband was working. He worked two jobs, God bless them. And when my youngest was going into first grade, he said, you know, you've been at home, which has been great. I was able, fortunate enough to raise my children, but to be able to contribute some sort of income would be helpful. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? I have to be able to still get the kids on and off the bus. And, um, and I, it's going to sound strange, but I just put it out to the universe. Like, I need a job that I can work from home, make my own hours, and make a lot of money. And... My, one of my good friends from high school called me and she's like, I work for this gentleman and his wife in the town over from us and um, they do Medicaid applications for residents in nursing homes. I think you'd be really good at it. I didn't know the difference between Medicare, Medicaid. I, did, I knew nothing. I sent my resume on a Monday. They interviewed me on a Tuesday. They hired me on Wednesday. Wow. They taught me from the ground up. Um, I shadowed. I went to all of their meetings. I went to their training sessions. Um, it is really a niche. You don't know that you need our services until you're in a crisis and now you need our services. But they were so good with me and they taught me everything I know. I was also at the same time, right before I got that job, I had applied to law school. 
um, and I was accepted to Mass School of Law. Um, so I got this, app, you know, this acceptance letter. Do I go to law school or do I take this chance and try this job and see where it goes? I obviously took the job. Um, when the gentleman and his wife retired two years later, they sold the company to three elder law attorneys. I then learned the legal way of doing all of this without technically being a lawyer. The lawyers then had certain policies that I didn't necessarily agree with. Um, and one of the mass health case workers said to me, she said, you have a really good reputation. You can go do this on your own. Um, I gave my notice and I started my own company. That mass health case worker retired a year and a half ago. She just joined my company yesterday. She, that was always in the plan that she said she so respected me that she wanted to come work for me when she retired. She had a non-compete for, for a year. Um, and then once that non-compete um, ended, she joined my staff yesterday. So, and that's really how it is. I just, okay, from so living in it. Like you, uh, you, you put yourself, you really threw yourself into this. I and did. You, and you were hungry to learn everything that they could teach you. I did. I thrive, in my company, for me and my company, I, we thrive on being the best. I know, you know, the Mass Health case workers have said you are the best in the business. The way we process documents, we put spreadsheets, like I said, we do the spreadsheets, we spell it all out for them. When you're submitting documents this high, we have orange, it's almost the same color in my jacket, orange divider sheets for every single category um, that lists out if there's property, if there's bank statements, the bank account numbers. Because when you're submitting three or four bank accounts in the stack, well, where does one Eastern bank account end and where does the next one start? So to have that divider sheet, and that's kind of the system that I just developed over time, is that each category of these um, applications, and now I'm giving away my secret, <laughs> mm -hmm. each category has its own divider sheet with all of the information that we use. Um, well done, awesome. you're doing a great job. Yeah, thank I'm you, so thank you. I honestly, I love, I love my company. I love what we do to be able to help the families is so rewarding because like I said, they come to us and mom has fallen and she's in the hospital and now she's got to go to a nursing home and how are they going to pay for it and what's going to happen to her house and they are in such crisis mode when they come to us that we are like, you know, and the nursing homes are on them like, well, you got to fill out this application. You have to do an application and they don't know. They don't even know where to begin. Mm -hmm. Some of that generation is very, very private with their, um, with their assets, and they don't know where these bank, you know, what the what they have in the bank, or what it, do, what do they have for life insurance policies. So for to for us to be able to take that off of them, so that they can just worry about being the son or the daughter and just handling sure that. Handling right, and we handle all of that. That's wonderful. So, we, and my staff, we base everything is upon um, compassionate and caring. You know, it's not, we do personalized one-on-one -on -one meetings unless like we have a son in Colorado that we have to do things over the phone. Um, some people still prefer Zoom because it's easier for them to come to the, instead of coming to our office. Um, for Maine, because I'm here, what I do is I will drive from my house in South Barwick to um, wherever the family is. I meet with them and then I go back and I will hand it off to one of my case managers who is then in daily contact, almost daily contact. Awesome. Do you have many clients who really get ahead of the game and contact you when everything is fine and, you know, knowing that down the road, you know, we're all in a continuum? Yeah, and that's really what I started doing these seminars. I do them in Massachusetts. I've been doing them up here in Maine as well because people need to know that there is this five-year look back and you can't just give money to your children and expect in three and a half years, you know, and you don't, no one thinks that they're going to go to a nursing home, but we don't, you don't know and you don't plan for it. And now all of a sudden we're sitting on a $75,000 transfer of assets that we have to resolve. Um, so I am finding that by doing these seminars and giving the people information up front, that they are coming to us up front and saying, okay, this is what I have, or this is what mom and dad has. What, what can we do to help to make sure that we're doing the right thing so in two or three years down the road we'll qualify for Medicaid without any issues? Can you, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, can you explain, like, the trust? Do we need to get a trust? So you would need to contact an elder law attorney, um, and you would set up an irrevocable trust. The trust has to be established. You have to put the assets into the trust, and there's a, usually a schedule of assets that the attorney will draw up for you. Um, that, in the, that trust has to be established for five years. So if you're establishing a trust in April of 2023, you can't touch anything of that 
pa you know, before, well, even still, you can't apply for Medicaid until April 27th of 2028. So it has to be established for five years, um, and nothing can be moved out of it in that five-year period. So if a bank account, is a bank account in the trust and you mm -hmm. can't get anything in or out of the bank account? Yes, you cannot touch that bank account oh, for five years. So, but but if but so, but one of the your biggest assets would be your house. And what if you mm -hmm. wanted like you still it. are going to be living in your house, but can you, the house be in the irrevocable? You trust? can put the house in the irrevocable trust, and you can still pay. I mean, you can still live in the house, depending on how the attorney writes up that trust on who would pay for your know, like the monthly expenses and all of that. Usually, the applicant can still. You could still pay for those expenses because you're living there, but the, the trust would own the house. So it doesn't become your asset now. It now becomes the trust asset. Could, but would it be, if you were living there and it was set up that the trust was going to pay the real estate taxes? Mm -hmm. um, but now you need a, a bank account for the trust as well. So that would be well, something there would, that... There, there would be a bank account for the trust anyway because you'd have some sort of funds in there too. Some people do not set up bank accounts with the trust. They'll just put the house in the trust and then the applicant, whoever's living there, pays the house expenses. But that would be something that you would have to, to talk to the attorney about. Those become legal how matters. How children? Like, how, how, how does that work? As far as if, the ch if the children were in the house? No, as far as trust. If you wanted to leave the, the assets to, the beneficiary, to your children beneficiaries? Um, that would it all be written into the trust with the attorney, um, but again, you wouldn't have access to any of those funds. You're giving up full access to all of those assets in order to qualify. So the person who, if you put it in, say your son or daughter's name, whatever, they they're a trustee, right? That's the term they use of the no the trust. So the trustee, so the grantor would be you putting your money or your house into the trust. So you're the grantor. Right. Then usually the problem is, is that you would want to stay on as a trustee and you usually bring a child in as a, a joint trustee. So there's usually two trustees, right. Um, so the trustee is the one that oversees the trust and then you have your beneficiaries of who is going to receive the assets. Okay. So that's usually how it works. And again, that's all done through the lawyers. But for an irrevocable, you can't be your own trustee. Right. No, yeah, this was right, a, yeah. my parents made a cardinal mistake. Right, yeah. <laughs> they did a revocable trust because they didn't want to relinquish. Right, and that's what happens a lot is that the, you know, the grantor is putting it, they said, well, I want to leave it to my kids, but I still want to be able to have access to it. Right. I don't want to, you know, leave. That was a mistake. Right. Well, you, but except for the gentleman that was here a couple of weeks ago, he was saying that because there are so few facilities that take only Medicaid and instead you have to get in by agreeing to pay two years private pay, mm -hmm. he said the biggest mistake people do is they'll put their assets into this irrevocable and then they and they neglected to leave out. Two hundred thousand. Yeah, three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. You know yeah. what I mean? To pay for your two years. Right. You know, for you know, so then um, you 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 have no bed to go to because everything's tied up in the. Yeah. So unless you break unless, the trust, unless it's it's set up that in in the in like you have a clause in there in the event there is no Medicaid bed anywhere. Okay. Well, the way to do it—that's a lawyer question. What I did was I built onto my house. I set up mm -hmm. a wing, you know, everything, yeah. and uh, staff at Bisting Angels, uh, et cetera. But it got—it was not easy. Right. right. Yeah. 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 I had a gentleman in Maine. He, his wife had dementia and was still living at home. And he had all of these assets. And what he did was he created his own company, like a caring company. It was his last name caring company and he was using his assets to pay for the aides to come into the house and by the time he came to me and the attorney in Kennebunk and he said you know he had this big all these spreadsheets and all these columns and he had you know profit and loss and and the balance sheet 
and we realized he was, and this was probably five or six years ago, right when I first started, and he was paying, he paid $17,000 a month for in-home care for his wife. And we said, it would have been less expensive if you had put her into a nursing home than it was, it was to better, private pay. It was better care, better care right. Well, this is the thing we're not <laughs> discussing, and, and yeah. this is, it's a psychological part. I mean, right, yeah. you can have the hardware, you can have the house and everything else right, and be yeah. staffed, whatever. Yeah. and go down into depression. Right, right. Right, right. and it's still hard because you're still in the house. You mean depression right. as the caretaker. Well, you can get that too. Right. Yeah. 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. It is. It's hard. A lot of the families that do try to keep their loved one at home and care for them, whether it's the children or husband or wife, it's very difficult because, I mean, you. C it's hard to get 24-7 care to come into the house. Well, not um, only that, but... To, for them to agree to whatever right. you're saying. Mm -hmm. They're adults. Right. You, right. you just can't order them around like a right. child and say, all right, you're not doing that. So it, it is a lot on the families to try to keep them at home. And I know some families try to do it as long as possible. Um, but ultimately, and what I always tell the families, because it is, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a hard decision to have to make, to say, you know what, I can't take care of mom at home anymore. She has to go to a nursing home. I always say, where are they safe? You know, I have one client right now, the mom is blind and she keeps falling and she was at home and she's like, I just can't, I can't take care of her anymore. You know, I go to the grocery store, I come back and she's on the floor. Um, it just became not safe for her to be at home. So I just said, you know what, you're making the best decision for your mom. And when she sat down and talked to her mom about it and she said, mom, you know, I love you. You know, I want what's best for you, but I just feel like you're not safe here anymore. And she was like, oh, absolutely, when do I sign up? She, she had her bag packed the next morning. She was like, she pulled out her suitcase. And I don't know how, she, like it was under her bed. She found her suitcase and she said to her daughter in the morning, so are we going today? And she's like, no, not today. But so I, in some ways, like you think that they're gonna be devastated, but in some ways, if they know, if they're scared at home and they know that they're a, a fall risk or a flight risk, they're probably going to feel much better. And then they're socialized. You know, they're, a lot of these nursing homes do have, most of the nursing homes do have activities for them. They bring in music. They'll bring in, you know, and there's other people for them to talk to. They usually have a dining room that they can go and socialize and have meals with. So it's not this horrible, like everybody has a stigma over nursing homes. They're really not as horrible as people think. Well, I, I, the, I you had said at the beginning that um, Medicaid won't pay for services at assisted living. Correct. And um, I had understood that if you met four of the seven areas of needing assisted living, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. like bathing. The adult, the whatever. activities of daily, ADLs, right. activities okay. of daily living. That they would cover for that nursing staff and you might just have to pay just for your room and board. That I can't totally answer because I know like Avita of Wells, they do have, and I'm not sure if it's full assisted living, but I know that they do have Medicaid beds available because I have done Medicaid right. apps right. for them. So, but I'm not, place a right, but I'm not sure where, where the cutoff is. Sometimes there's these gray areas of where people fall. So I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't answer that question for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Can I just, this is probably a stupid question, but the, going back to the trusts, what is the point of setting up the irrevocable trust? Is it to sustain you when you're in the nursing home or to no, it would be your money for your children? No, it would be for your children. So if you had a family home like on um, Sebago, and you wanted that family home to be preserved for your kids. You would put it into the trust so that it would go to your heirs down the line. It avoids probate too, doesn't it? It avoids probate also. Okay. So, so that's, that's irrevocable or revocable, either one of them. Right, right. right. Yeah. The, ir the revocable just means it can be changed. And the state's going to say if it can be changed, you can take it out and put it back in your name. And, and I get it from a taxpayer point of view. I totally get that. You know, if you've got somebody that's sitting on a $500,000 house that is in a, a revocable trust or that should be used towards their care. Yeah. As a taxpayer, I, I totally understand that and respect that. 
I also respect the fact that if it's an ir in an irrevocable trust and it's a family home and you want to preserve that for your um, beneficiaries and your heirs, then that should be allowed. You know, that's where that regulation comes in as well. So, but as a taxpayer, I totally understand that if somebody has assets, they should be using their assets to pay for their care. When did it change from three years look back to five years? I have been doing this for 15 years and it's always been five years. Yeah, I was say it. It's, uh, it's, as for long as I've been doing it, it's been five years. Four, three years. Yeah, that's what I heard. I also, every now and then, I'll catch a rumor that, um, and it's not usually from the, the state, it's usually from people saying, oh, I heard it's, they're going to seven. I said, the caseworkers don't even want to deal with five years of bank statements. I know they don't want to do seven. Mm -hmm. So, um, but as of right now, and it's, as long as I've been doing it, it's five years. I wonder what the statistics are on how many people are on main care. I'm sure that's out there. I that I don't know. And how many will be in 10, 15? Well, it's years? that baby boomer right. that's coming through. Um, in Massachusetts right now, we have five or six people that are under 65 that already have early Alzheimer's, um, which is something that we have I haven't seen before. So we do have under 65 long-term care applications that are in right now. Scary. It's really scary. Um, a couple of the doctors that I've spoken to have said the pandemic brought a lot of that out, mm -hmm. and so people are come, becoming more aware of it earlier. Um, but it is this, this is the baby boomer stage, so we're doing applications for people in their 60s all the way to people in their 90s. Um, I actually have one applicant that's 102, God bless her. Mm -hmm. so, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, we're busy right now. Yeah. <laughs> going to get busier too. Yep. I think we need to start building prisons and start building <laughs> nursing yeah. homes. That's yep. Nursing yep. care. That's yep. Well, mean, thank you all very, very much. Um, you have my information. So I gave you, I think everyone has my business card. And